Thank you, Cheryl. Puts us in the right state of mind when we understand and feel connections. Um, it's a visceral feeling. We need to feel the connections. And, I, and I've said this before, but strong connections are literally a matter of life and death for us. Connections keep us alive. In our community affirmation, we recite at the end of each service, we say, service is our prayer. The elevation of service to being prayer is very transcendent in the Unitarian Universalist community. The gift of service is the gift of connection that we give to one another. As we heard from Abigail and Olivia in Wisdom for All Ages, those who provide gifts of service every day in our lives are among the most important connections we have. They are not our deep-rooted family and friends, but we depend on them and their connections with us every day. This morning, we are going to hear from some of our own congregation who devote their lives to service. I've asked them to take a few moments to explain the gift of service they provide, why it is important, and what would happen if they weren't there to provide it. Before I begin with that group, when I, we're going to be recognizing, in, we get to Memorial Day and other times, but I, I know that many of us have served our country through the armed forces here. Um, Paul is active in the Navy. Uh, Gary and Rob are both retired, or they're veterans. They're still working hard, but... Um, and their service is selfless, so I want to thank you and everyone here that has served our country in that way. I want to first invite Luis Para. Luis retired from his service as a bus driver with JTA, but he continues his service providing transportation for seniors. Buenos dias. Uh, I was really honored to be invited up here by Peter because I don't get up here very often. And I love it up here, you know. You, <laughs> you all think you have a great view. You haven't seen nothing yet until you stand here. And it gives me a chance to, you know, show off my jacket. Yes. <laughs> In any case, like Peter said, I retired from JTA, Jacksonville Transit. Authority, which was my last gig, uh, <clears throat> extensive gig, five and a half years, and and uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of stories I could tell you about uh, rubbing shoulders with the crowd that 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 uses our service. Uh, I, I I invited my my child once in the blue moon on on Saturdays when I know he was going to be bored, and I would tell him, Hey, why don't you come and ride with me? You know. We'll have a good time, and he, he, he rode with me a few times until the powers that be found out about it, and they told me, uh-uh, you can't do that, <laughs> but we have fun, and um, I remember one time he came up to me and said, hey, Dad, why do they call you baby? Because some of the, some of the ladies, you know, in town, they say, oh, baby, I'm so glad to see you. I've been sitting in the sun all day, you know, they, all the... All the passengers, they love to see me come up to the bench after being sitting there waiting. And, you know, it started getting to my head. I was thinking it was just me, you know, that they liked. And it had nothing to do with the fact that the bus was AC and it's hot summer. But, but uh, so, I'm, I'm, and, I'm, I'm, I'm not, and I'm seeing people coming the bus and they're limping, they're in pain, complaining, you know, I'm already, I'm already 50 and I'm, I'm having hard. And I just keep my mouth shut because I'm, I'm 10 years their senior. Just keep my mouth shut, keep driving. People in bikes, you know, putting the bike in the front. So it was, it was a lot of fun, but it's also an ordeal. I mean, the biggest problem JTA has is driver turnover, you know. People just don't last, especially when you know your first run is at 5 o'clock and you have to be in the other side of town 
It was going to take you 45 minutes to get there, and it would take you know, 30 minutes to get the bus out of the yard, so you better get up at 3? No. That, that happens sometimes. So uh, service, it, it, when Pete asked me, that, you know, I was, I talk, talk about service. The first thing I do is I look up the definition of service in the dictionary. That's what I do when I'm going to talk about anything because it doesn't come easy sometimes. The action of helping or doing work for someone. Millions are involved in voluntary service is the example. And yeah, I'm, I want to be feel grateful that I'm able to serve others. Uh, like Pete said, I run into uh, internet talks, TED talks, and YouTube talks telling you, if you don't have friends, if you don't network, if you don't serve others, you're going to die young because that's the only thing that keeps you alive. Basically, it's what they're telling us nowadays. You know? And that might be true. That, that, that could be true. And nowadays, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm in a special place because I'm serving a group of retired people like me. I, when I'm with them, I kind of make believe I'm one of them. You know, we go to the restaurant, I'm sitting around with them. When it's time to go, they're looking at me like, well, are we going? Oh, oh, that's right, I'm the driver, right? Yeah, let me go get the bus. Because I start thinking that like I'm one of them. But even them, when they talk, one of the com they complain, you know, the, you know, the biggest problem is I don't have any responsibilities. You know, it is, it is uh, important to continue to, to continue to mean something. And who do you mean something to if not other people? You know? And then you get your meaning by the meaning you give other people. And that's my uh, service story. Thank you for your time. I enjoy being up here every time I come up here. Thank you. I don't know, I feel a sermon coming from that guy. We'll see. We'll see. Um, so um, the second person I wanted to invite up is our church administrator, um, Laura Tavalaris. Um, Laura does not want to come up here. This is not where she likes to be. But we don't realize everything she does. And I just wanted her to share a little bit about that. Laura? Hi. I had to write everything down so I don't just like freeze up and stare at you. <laughs> um, okay. Well, when Peter asked me to talk a little bit about my job here, I was kind of surprised because I, I talk to church members every day. So I thought, yeah, you all know what I do. It's, it's boring. But um, I'll, I'll kind of give you a rundown of some of the things that I do. So I reserve rooms for the church meetings and for outside renters. I order supplies. I do payroll. I pay invoices. I make sure that our service providers provide us with documentation, such as W-9 forms and um, certificates of insurance. I basically receive everything that comes into the church. So if it comes in by mail, by phone, by email, I receive it, decide what needs to happen with it. Some of the things I can handle myself, other things I pass on to another staff member, a committee chair, a board member, um, or whoever I think might be able to handle whatever the issue is. Um, as an aside, if you get an email from a church member, from the minister, from anybody asking you to buy gift cards, don't do it. <laughs> um, part of my job is also making sure that um, UUCJ keeps up to date with things like our sales tax exemption, our termite protection, our alarm registration with the city, our corporate registration with the state, our water system backflow testing, uh, our annual certification with the UUA. These things keep UUCJ in compliance with government entities and also make sure that we're in compliance and good standing with the UUA so that our delegates can vote at General Assembly in June. And we have the town hall after this talking about something that's coming up for a vote. Um, my job is also to make sure that donations are received and applied um, properly, um, both to the donor's account so that your contribution statements are correct, but also to the correct fund so that when we have a special collection, we know how much did we raise for that other organization, so I know how much to, <laughs> to send to them, and also how much we have for projects such as our social hall renovation that's going on right now. Um, I make sure, of course, that the bills are paid so that we keep the lights on and we have our Zoom 
um, account active, and we have candles for joys and sorrows. Um, I also make sure that the expenditures are coded correctly in the system so the finance committee and the board can make proper decisions. Um, and I also sort of do anything else that, <laughs> that comes up. Um, but I think it's really important, really important to me, um, to say that nothing I do, I do alone. Because everything I do, I'm depending on another, another staff member, a board member, a church member. I mean, so many church members help out with so many things. There's no way in the world that I could even begin to do my job without everybody. So thank you. So if the lights go off in the middle of service, we know who to talk to, okay? <laughs> and that's why they don't. Um, again, so much happens behind the scenes to, to make everything happen here. And as Laura said, every one of us, and I look around, every one of us is doing our part to make sure that happens. Um, I wanted to invite a third person, uh, Lynn Shad. Lynn has truly made miracles happen through what we might consider a dry subject, financial planning, but it's not. Yeah, some of us serve in obvious ways. We're a nurse, a teacher, a doctor, um, a librarian, helping someone find just the right book. And I'm a certified financial planner, so my obvious way of helping is helping people with their investments, their taxes, planning for their future, and passing their assets on. And I know, maybe even more than some of my clients know, where they would be if we had not met together. Some of them were working hard, not saving in the most tax-advantaged way, so it's a very good feeling to know that you've made a difference, my team has made a difference in people's lives. But what I want to talk about is sometimes there are ways of serving in much more subtle ways. And those subtle ways can be just as important or more important. Sometimes it's just a smile, a friendly greeting that lifts someone's spirit, someone you maybe didn't even know was having a bad day. Connecting and listening to people. I have a client who was a teacher. She did a lot of volunteer work at the library. She did taxes for seniors with AARP, Clara White Mission, many, many other places. But she had cancer 10 years ago. She lost half of her face her right eye, her, her part of her right jaw, her palate. She can't eat, swallow, or talk well without an artificial palate the University of Florida has made for her. And she can put it in when she wants to try to talk. She's almost 90 now, and she can't get out as much as she used to, but she still has that volunteer spirit. She's not a Unitarian, but I know service is her prayer. <laughs> I have seen it. But, so she can't get out much, but she can knit. <laughs> and she knits. Look, look, look at that and the lines in it. And she um, can connect to people that way, but she can't get out and talk to her charities as much as she used to or even deliver uh, her goods. But I have a group of wonderful friends <laughs> that, as part of their service, we collected her knitted scarves, her lap blankets, her Afghans bless them together. Abigail and Olivia helped. And then distributed them to different groups in Jacksonville. 
hospice, the homeless. The homeless were very important to her. She grew up very, very poor. Um, and senior centers. I took pictures and shared the pictures with her to tell you that it was very fulfilling and emotional to share those pictures with her. You, I can see from the smiles on some of your faces, you get what that meant to her. She still wants to serve. So I talked to her last week, and she was still very upbeat. She said she had bought 11 skeins of yarn. And she was telling me about, they didn't have quite the right color, she's very particular about her colors and her designs. And, and they were on sale. So that made it even better. And she said she was so inspired. She said, y'all gave me inspiration. And she's continuing to knit. Now, yes, my team at Morgan Stanley, we made her and her charities a lot of money. We saved a lot in, in taxes for her. But by listening and connecting to her, we were able to serve her in a much, much greater way. We gave her inspiration. And that's what just sometimes you don't even, you're not even aware that you're giving to someone else, that warm feeling, a smile. What, and, and also, if you have a group that knows, she, she also told me when I talked to her the other day, that she has already knitted two more. So if you have a group or you know someone that would benefit, it would give them a happy feeling, just send me a text or let me know and I'll bring them to church next week. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I just know all the little services you do, whether it's a Tessie hug or a Kelly hug or our greeters just greeting us, the musicians, Hope smile when she sings. Um, that's what binds us all together. So thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I'd like to invite Michael Aiken. Um, Michael has been a longtime teacher um, dedicated to his students and his studies. Thank you, Peter. I'm really honored that you invited me today. And the three people before me, that's a hard act to follow. Um, <clears throat> I have, I'm in my 19th year of teaching. Next year will be my probably last. I may go one more year after that, but, um, uh, but I'll be reaching the end of that. The, teaching is my second profession. I was an advertising representative for newspapers uh, the 20 years before that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, being a teacher, Today's hymn struck me today, and that's why I brought this up here. There's a line from that hymn, and uh, about, it's almost about what teaching is about. And the line in here says, um, and it'll tell me that I'm somebody. And up here, it's got the soul, the heart, and the mind will tell me I'm somebody. Well, you know, it's my job, it's my service, as Peter pointed out, for me to tell the children that come into my class, it's my job to tell them outside of their circle that they are somebody. And that has a lot more impact than them reading it and saying it to themselves. And if I could, if you will bear with me for a moment, I have two things, two examples to give you about what it came to me about what I do. And I had been teaching about seven or eight years, and one day I was in my classroom, and I heard a knock on the door. And I looked up, and I could see through the window. That's, by the way, that's when we had windows that weren't covered that I could look through. You know, we have to cover them now for shooters. But... Um, 
I could see through outside my window a young man that I didn't know what this was about. And he looked like somebody in a uniform. So I went to the door and I opened it and it was a young man with a woman and a baby carriage and a baby. And he looks up at me and says, Mr. Aiken, it's me. And I went, yeah? And he goes, don't you remember me? It's me. And he goes, he goes, I was like trouble for you in your class. I made lots of trouble for you. And I said, oh yeah, you're someone that I don't forget. He goes, well, I wanted to come here today to bring my wife and my baby. I wanted them to meet you. And he showed me his stripe. He was a corporal. And he said, I joined the military because of you. And he goes, I have my wife and daughter because of you. And, <laughs> and he came in and we talked a few minutes and he was showing his little girl off to me and, and everything. And then when he finally left, I will tell you that for about 20 minutes after I left, I sat at my desk and I wept. That was the first time that it came to me and it took six or seven years about what I do. It touched upon me about how impactful teachers are, not just me. And by the way, I'm up here and it's not about me. And it has always been about those kids. That's what it's about. I have one more to tell you. I had a young lady uh, about 10 or 11 years ago and she literally could not read. But she was a senior. They had pushed her through the system. She was about to age out, and they had her in my class. And um, when I realized that she was really s severely limited on her abilities to comprehend anything of what I teach in class, I would take time out to work with her a few minutes in each one of the classes that I had with her to try the best I could to give her the skills to learn. Well, she came to class every day. She never missed a class. She did every assignment that I gave her, and each assignment was wrong, every one. And uh, I just kept encouraging her, and I did the best I could with her, and I finally got broke down. I said, you know, I need to get to the bottom of this. So I remember I went and got a file, her file, out of the guidance office. And then when I read the file, I cried when I read the file. She, her father had taken off when she was three or four years old. Her mother was dying of cancer. She was, she was working a job, caring for her two sisters, and never missing a day of my class doing it. And she was there to do the work that I gave her, even though she wasn't getting it. Well, more than a couple of times, I would drive home and have to pull off the road and just cry over this student. So <clears throat> life goes on, she graduates. Well, about three or four years after that, I've got my daughter with me, and uh, I'm with a couple of other families, and we're going to the zoo. Jacksonville Zoo to do the spooktacular. I think they still do that. I'm not sure. And uh, I had taken my daughter, Jamie. I had broken off with the other two families. When I had Jamie, she wanted to go do the bounce house. So there was this large area where they had bounce houses and that kind of thing. And I got her in there, and I'm watching her, and I'm standing there, and all of a sudden I hear this screech across this expanse with all these carnival back things that are going on. And I keep, I thought I heard something, and I, then I finally heard, Mr. Aiken, Mr. Aiken. And I like turned around, and it was Letitia, that student that couldn't read. And she ran up to me, and she goes, look. And she had a uniform on for the Jacksonville Zoo. And I went, my God, you work here. She goes, yes, I do. And she said, I want you to know that I'm a supervisor here. And I went, really? She goes, yes, I supervise all the feed that comes into the zoo for requisitions, and I handle all that for distribution. And I went, oh my God. I went, that is awesome. 
And she goes, and I never forgot what you told me one day. You told me that you were confident in me that I would make it to be what I wanted to be because I came to your class every day. And she goes, I'm here to tell you that look at me, I got my name on this, on my uniform. She left, you know, she had, I got to go back because I'm manning one of these stations. I went, you bet, Letitia, you, you go, girl. And when Jamie came back to me after that, she's going, Dad, why are you crying? <laughs> That's the thing about teaching. Those two incidents weighed on me about what I mean to the students who come into my class. They may not look like it, they may not act like it, but they're looking for something. You've all been there, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. You don't know who you are. You're just trying to figure out what you are and where you belong. And that's what I deal with on a daily basis with these kids. And I call them my kids because they are my kids. And I used to do something at the beginning of every class. I've stopped doing it. And I, don't, I was sitting back there tonight today thinking about why I stopped doing it. But to start off every school year, I would take a poll from my kids. And I would ask them, I need all of you to get a piece of paper out and write down to me the five most valuable natural resources we have in the country. And by the way, I teach history. That's what, that's what this is about. And they would, they would write them out. They would turn them in. And then I'd collect them, and I said, you know what, I'm not going to look at them. I want you to raise your hands and tell me what you think those resources are. And I would write them on the board, and they would give me the usual stuff, oil, gold, silver. They would say water. You know, they would come up with things like that. And I'd go a few minutes, and then after I'd, I'd finish, I'd go, you know, you guys left out the most valuable resources we have in this country. And they're like looking at me. And they go, what do you mean, Mr. Aiken? That, those are the things that are important. I went, no. I said, the most valuable resource we have in this country is you, our children. And, you know, I used to love to do that because they'd sit there and you could see the wheels turning. I wasn't expecting that, you know. So that's what this is about. That's what my profession is about. Um, I... I uh, I can't believe that I waited for 20 years to be a teacher. I should have been doing it my entire life. I revel in it. I, I, sometimes those kids will make me drive home and I'll have a big grin on my face. There'll be other times I'll be driving home depressed over what we're doing to our kids, about what some of the things that the government is trying to force me to do. And I, I don't want to get into that, but they'll, they're trying to tell me to lie to my kids about slavery and things like that. And I'm not going to do that. That's why I'm probably going to get out in a year or two. And I could go a little bit further, but my wife probably won't let me. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I would just like to kind of, because I, I know that I'll miss it when I leave. And what do I mean by that? And I, I'm not trying to be funny or anything. But Bear Bryant was a coach for the Alabama football team. And he was a long-serving coach for them. And I remember when he died, when he retired, he died within two months of that, of him retiring. And it used to, I used to wonder about that. Did he just die because he thought, I'm no longer useful in this capacity? It made me wonder. I mean, I'm not trying to bring a down or anything, but I'm sorry that I'm going to meet that point, and I hope I don't feel that way, but I'm going to miss my kids. I'll miss every one of them, whether they gave me trouble or not, because they are worth it, and they are worth it to our society to try to build our future on those kids. So, I'm sorry, I went too long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When it comes to services or prayer, they got something to pray about, don't they? That was great. Let's give a round of applause to all of our speakers today. Really appreciate you doing that. Um, Lynn Shad had shared with me an article a couple months ago 
um, that I knew I wanted to incorporate and ended up incorporating today, it was in the New York Times um, by Paula Spann. And it, the article was called, They May Just Be Acquaintances, They're Important to You Anyway. So I'll close out talking a little bit about that. Um, she speaks of the importance of connections, which are called peripheral ties. They're in contrast to close family or friends. They could be classmates, coworkers, neighbors, church members, or near strangers at the coffee shops, grocery stores, or Uber drivers. She says, quote, such seemingly trivial interactions have been shown to boost people's positive moods and reduce their odds of depressed moods. Weak ties matter, not just for our moods, but for our health, says Gillian Sandstrom, a psychologist at the University of Sussex in England who has researched their impact. Quote, she says, if I asked who you confided in, you wouldn't mention them. Yet the resulting sense of belonging that weak ties confer is essential to thriving, feeling connected to other people, even among introverts, which is how Dr. Sandstrom defines herself. Studies show that those who interacted with more weak ties reported greater happiness and a greater sense of well-being and belonging compared to those with fewer interactions. Most of the participants in these studies were younger, but one study followed an old, a sample of more than 800 seniors in metropolitan Detroit over 23 years. Over time, the number of weak ties more strongly predicted well-being than the number of close ties. Weak ties, quote, provide you with a low demand opportunity for interaction, Dr. Tony Antonucci said, a psychologist from the University of Michigan and the senior author of this study. He said, quote, it's cognitively stimulating, it's engaging. Weak ties, including those developed online, don't necessarily turn into close ties, and they don't have to. After all, when we think of our close relationships, on the other side of those can be conflict, demands for reciprocity, and complications. In other words, in the relationship, there might be more demanded to you in a closer tie. Now, the impact of COVID has had a severe implications for us as a community. We lost a lot of contacts with the service community during that time. And um, we're regaining those back, but it's still a process. So for younger people, particularly like people, although we're not always younger moving back to Jacksonville, right, Com coming from uh, Galveston, um, for younger people moving into Jacksonville, try to create those connections um, can be difficult. So it might be at work, it might be here at church, it might be at the gym, but we need to be conscious about how we make those connections. Um, as we age, some of our connections fall off the wayside. Uh, people pass away, people move away, um, our interests move. So reconnecting and finding those connections is important. Now re remember, when, when we think about Publix, um, or going to you know, any store, um, not Publix, they're pretty good, but other stores, some people may not really want to connect. They're not interested in connecting, right? Um, and uh, I used to kid about it when I was in New Jersey. If you went to a Kmart, no one wanted to help you. You had to get on the red phone, and you'd probably talk to somebody in Ohio. But, um, but the fact of the matter is, your smile, like Lynn said, your words of affirmation to that person, that makes a difference for that person who may be having a rough day or just trying to survive and make it through the day so they can get to childcare to pick up their kid. So what I say is, in our conclusion, and Michael, you stole the words from me with the song, we are somebody, and we're somebody because we're connected to somebody. And that level of deepness does not necessarily make a difference. Connection is being intentional about it, whether it's to our loved one or to the person we're meeting 
at the doctor's office, connecting with caring people in all aspects of our life will literally give us life. Cheryl? <laughs>